Hello, in this presentation, we're going to take a look at the allowance method, which is, of course, related to the accounts receivable account. We will be able to define the allowance method, record transactions related to recording bad debt, recording a receivable account that has been determined to be uncollectible, recording a receivable account that has been collected after being determined that it was uncollectible. So we're going to take a look at some different transactions, the most common transactions when dealing with the allowance method and see what those look like and why we use the allowance method. We're going to work through a problem. So what we're going to have here is we've got our accounting equation, of course. We have our trial balance. I do suggest working problems to take a look at a trial balance because it can give you the context uh, in which to work problems. So here's what we have. We've got the assets in green. The liabilities are going to be orange. The light blue is the capital account and the equity section. And then we have the income statement in the darker blue, which is going to be the revenue and the expenses. We can see in this example, we have net income. Uh, the net income is going to be calculated as revenue minus expenses. We don't have any expenses at this time. We're just going to note this revenue number so that when we work through the problem, we can see what the effect is on uh, net income. Note that we're representing debits with positive numbers or non-bracketed numbers and credits with bracketed numbers. That allows us to have uh, lesser columns and, and use this quick worksheet too. Uh, calculate the balancing of the debits and the credits by having the debits minus the credits equal zero. So that's what we have here. We are going to be focusing in on the receivables section, of course, and uh, we're going to post transactions to this trial balance to see the uh, adjustment in relation to the trial balance. Then we'll also look at the accounts related to the receivable accounts. So oftentimes we'll take a look at the general ledger. There's going to be a general ledger account, of course, related to all types of accounts. All accounts on the trial balance will have a general ledger account, which will be in order by date. We're only going to look at the two general ledger accounts that we're going to be working with in this problem being accounts receivable and the allowance account. So those are the two we're going to look at. Of course, just keep in mind that there's going to be other general ledger accounts for all of uh, the accounts on the trial balance. Then we're going to take a look at the accounts receivable subsidiary ledger. So remember that the subsidiary ledger is going to give the same detail that's basically in the general ledger. However, instead of just breaking it out by date, it's going to break it out by customer who owes the company money. So remember the questions that will happen in relation to the receivable. Uh, we're going to ask, well, who owes us? Do people owe us money? Yeah, people owe us one million two hundred. Who owes us money? For that, we go to the receivable account. So we just got these generic names. These are our customers: G Company, D Company. G, G owes us 30, uh, BD owes us 8, CB owes us 0, C, uh, KT owes us 3,000, M owes us 4, CW owes us 9, P owes us 6, 7, and all other vendors. Note that this thing are customers, all other customers. Note that this thing could be very long. This subsidiary ledger could be very long, uh, and we could have a professional accounts receivable employee just tracking this information, which would be dealing with this report a lot. All other customers add up to 1,139,3. And that means that if we add all those up, it adds up to 1,000,002. So note that the uh, receivable subsidiary ledger ties out to the general ledger, ties out to the trial balance. Now, the new account we have here will be the allowance account here. So now we have an allowance account. Note that it's still green, it's an asset account, but it has brackets, meaning it's a credit balance account. So it's a contra. Uh, asset account. It's an asset account that has a uh, debt credit balance, which is contra to the norm, which is normally a debit balance in asset accounts. So the, the question, many times when I teach accrual accounting to new students, they often think that the way we recognize revenue is overstating revenue under an accrual basis, because when we do work on accounts, we're going to increase revenue and we increase the assets by increasing debit and receivables and crediting revenue. And if we haven't received the money, there could be a valid argument to say, well, yeah, we did the work and you can say we earned it, but it's, it could very well be that we never get the money. And if we're recognizing revenue at the point of sale before we get the money, then isn't it true that we're probably going to be overstating revenue by those revenues that we're not going to receive in cash? And isn't it true that the accounts receivable is going to be overstated by the amount that we're not going to get? You're reporting this asset of 1200 on the books, pretty large asset. Are you sure you're going to get all that? Aren't we overstating? And isn't there a generally accepted accounting principle that basically says that we want to be uh, error on the conservative side, meaning 
when we talk about conservatives, conservatism, in this case, we don't mean uh, political conservatism. We mean that we'd rather err on the side of looking kind of worse, meaning assets being understated and liabilities being overstated it, rather than the other way around. Because uh, from a generally accepted accounting principle, these statements are being geared towards outside users being stockholders and creditors. And uh, we don't want to overstate our position to them. So you can see from a regulatory body, they would rather us uh, err on the side of understating the, the receivable. And it would seem that the accrual method does the exact opposite. And it's not till this point that we can kind of talk about how the generally accepted accounting principles deals with that. And the way they deal with that is they say that we need to account for that. We need to say, hey, you know what? Yeah, people owe us 1200000 but we believe that in this case, 40000 is going to be uncollectible. How do we know that? We're going to talk a bit more about that towards the end, but the general idea, the general principle will be that we need to tell our readers that we, we believe that certain amount is going to be uncollectible. So if it's going to be significant, if the amount is significant, the generally accepted accounting principles requires us to use the allowance method rather than the direct write-off method. The allowance method is this method we're looking at here, which says that um, we're going to have to report the amount of the receivable that we think is going to be uncollectible. So under the direct write-off method, by contrast, what would happen is, for example, if this individual CW company uh, could not pay, if CW company went bankrupt or whatever, we determined that this company is not going to pay us. When they uh, come to us and tell us, okay, we're not going to pay us, we, we're going to look at their accounts receivable and say, all right, yeah, they owe us 9000 we need to make that go down. So the receivable account is going to go down when that happens uh, under under either method we use. We know we got to take it out of the receivable because we have now determined we're not going to receive it. Therefore, we're going to credit the receivable. Where should the debit go? And if you think about it, what really happened if we're not going to get paid by a client or a customer, it means that we overstated revenue at some point in the past. In the past, we overstated revenue because we increased revenue by a sale that's not really going to happen. Didn't really, it's not really a sale if we're never going to get paid for it. So you would think that the debit would go to revenue, which would reduce revenue because we overstated revenue. There's a couple problems with that, however. One is that we don't like to decrease revenue directly. Remember that revenue basically always goes up and we almost never debit revenue. So and so therefore we make another account. That other account is going to be called bad debt expense. So the expense is going to go up, which brings down net income. So under the direct write-off method, that's what would happen. We would take it out of the uh, the receivable, and we would record the expense when it is determined that uh, the client's not going to pay us, and we wouldn't have this allowance account at all. We wouldn't have it here, and that would be a fairly simple method. That's the easiest method to do. If the receivables are immaterial in, in uh, decision-making, then we can't use that method. But if the receivables are material, there's another problem here, and that is that uh, note that if we write off this 9000 that we, we wrote into revenue last year, it was part of revenue last year, and we're writing the expense related to it, or the reduction in net income this year, then we're, we're violating the matching principle because we're, we're reducing it in relation to this income, but the 9000 isn't included in this income. It's not included in this 379, 378, because it was... Uh, earned, we re recorded an income last period, and we already closed that out to the capital retained earnings account. So that means that, that that's the problem. So under the accrual method, what we want to do is match the expense with the revenue. So we we want to look at the same time period and say, okay, I'm going to I'm going to say that this amount is going to be uncollectible in relation to this revenue. And that's going to be an estimate. So we had to make an estimate and do that. We'll talk more about how the estimate will work later, but just note that at the end of last period, we made an estimate and we said, okay, of the one million two that uh, is outstanding, we believe that forty thousand is not going to be collectible. And now, when someone comes to us and says that uh, they're not going to pay us the nine thousand, then instead of debiting the expense at that point in time, we're just going to debit the allowance. So it would look like this. So under the allowance method. When someone, a customer is determined that they will not pay us, then we're going to reduce the receivable with a credit. The debit will go to the allowance account. What will that look like in terms of the trial balance? 
well, we can see here that the re receivable is going to be credited, so that's going to go down. So obviously that has to go down. And all we're going to do on the other side is we're just going to debit the allowance. The allowance has a credit balance. We're going to debit it, doing the opposite thing to it, which will make it go down. Notice that the, the book value of the receivables, the net value, is going to be unchanged because it was before 1,000,002 minus the 40. That's the net value. And now uh, receivables went down and so did the uh, allowance. So therefore, now it's the 1,091,000 minus the, 30, the 31. So notice there's no effect on net income down here. And that is because we basically already wrote off this 9,000 included in the 40,000 last time period uh, when we when we created the allowance account. And we'll do that again at the end of this of this presentation. So you can see if, if we go through our series of questions, then we're going to ask, well, do, do people owe us money? Yeah, the trial balance says that people owe us 1,191. Well, who owes us some money? Well, if we look at the GL account, it doesn't tell us that. If we look at the GL account, it just tells us by date that we had 1,002,000 and it went down by 9. If we look at the GL account for the allowance, we can see that that's basically telling us that this uh, was an amount that was not paid. Uh, and we had to write it off even though we were not paid for it. And then, so we're going to have to look at the subsidiary ledger, which is an order by customer. So if we look at the customer in this case, we're going to say that uh, CW is the one that we are writing off so this nine here is also recorded here and it's also recorded here so this is the same information that is now recorded in terms of customers and then if you take that off now the cw owes us zero and if we add up all the customers then it adds up to 1,191 for those are the people that owe us money that ties out to the general ledger that ties out to the receivable uh, account here and note that we have 31,000 that we do not believe is collectible. We cannot apply that 31 to any of the actual customers because it's just an estimate. We don't know who's not going to pay us. We just believe that certain amount of folks aren't going to pay us based on prior experience. So now we have G Company made a partial payment and went bankrupt. It is determined that we will not receive the balance. So we're going to receive 20,000 of cash and then we're not going to receive the other 10. So if we look at G here, we can see that the uh, company owes us 30,000. They're going to go bankrupt and they're in, within the bankruptcy, assuming they uh, paid off who they could, which they paid off us 20, and then they're not going to pay the rest because they went bankrupt. So that is what's happened. If we go through our series of questions, then we can say, well, is cash affected? In this case, it is. We got 20000 so we're going to increase cash. It's going to go up in the debit direction by 20 Normally, when we get paid, the normal uh, credit will go to, in this case, receivables, because that's why they paid us. They paid us to pay off the receivable. So the receivable has a debit balance. We're going to make it go down by crediting it. However, we're not going to credit it by the 20. We need to credit it by the entire amount owed, which is the 30. And the reason for that is because if we only uh, credited by 20, then we would show that G owes us 10 still, and they don't, or they're not going to pay us. So we got to write that off. So therefore, we're going to have a difference, and we're going to need another debit. Where will that debit go? Uh, that is going to be the uncollectible portion, which we're going to put into the allowance method. Remember, under the direct write-off method, that debit would go to the bad debt expense. At the time, uh, it was uncollectible or determined to be uncollectible. Under the allowance method, we already had this $31,000. We already, we already estimated that that $10,000 was not going to be collectible. We just didn't know who was not going to collect it. We already wrote it off in the prior period to match it to the income that was generated in the prior period. And now we're just going to uh, take it to the allowance. So journal entry would look like this. We have the debit to cash. Cash is going up by the 20000 We're going to credit the receivable for the entire 30. And then the difference is going to the allowance to debit here. We can see that the 20 plus the 10 equals the 30. The debits equal the credits. Also note that I would put it in this order because this is the order that it, when I think through the journal entry, that's the order that works best for me to think through it. However, if you're going to post this to something that's going to grade you on uh, having the debits on top, you might want to put the two debits on top. If it helps you to audit or something like that and go back to the information and look at it, then I would record it in whatever way helps you to think through the process. All right, so if we're going to record that in terms of the trial balance, it would look something like this. The cash is going to be debited, so it's going from uh, 100 Plus the 20, it's going to go up. We're doing the same thing to it. So we're debiting a debit balance account, increasing it. The receivable is going to go down. So we had the debit here. 
we are crediting it, doing the opposite to it, bringing the receivable down by the 30, and then that difference is going to go to the allowance. So notice the allowance is a contra account, meaning it's an asset with a credit balance. We're debiting it, doing the opposite thing to it, bringing it down. So then if we think of our questions, do people owe us money? Yeah, people owe us 1,161. Who owes us money? Well, if we look at the general ledger, it tells us detail, but it only tells us the activity by date. So we had people owed us 1,002. Then uh, we had this 9,000 that it went down by. And then we had the 30 that it went down by. Normally that would be from payments. In this case, it went down because we were not paid and we were, or we weren't paid on all that we got, we got 20 out of the 30 on this one. But some of them were due to writing it down. We also have the allowance uh, here showing this activity. Here's where the 10 is being posted to the allowance. Here's of course where the 30 is being posted to the general ledger. Now, if we want to know uh, who owes us money, we would have to go to the subsidiary ledger. So in this case, note that this 30,000 is being recorded in G's account. So they owed us 30. Uh, now uh, they paid us 10 and we wrote off, I mean, they paid us 20 and we wrote off the other 10 because we determined it was not going to be collectible. That's back down to zero. If we add up all customers, then it will add up to 1,161. That ties out to the general ledger. That ties out to the trial balance. Of that, we still have this estimate of 21 that will be not collectible. So the reason it went from the, the prior balance when we started this, which was 40, and now it's going down is because uh, we now know who's not going to pay us. So this was the estimate, and we didn't know who wasn't going to pay us. Now we've determined that these amounts are uncollectible, and we're writing it off against that 40000 and then applying it out to the correct customers, which are now determined to be uncollectible. All right, next item, receive payment from CW after we had assumed the bad debt uncollectible had been written off. So in this case, what we're saying is that this is an unusual case, but it's good to look at because it kind of shows us what would happen uh, if someone came in the door and said, here I am, I'm going to pay you now. And we had totally wrote them off in the past because we didn't think that we were going to get paid from them. So in this case, remember that the CW company owed us 9000 we determined we're not going to get paid that. We wrote off the 9000 to the allowance account here. So we wrote them off, and now they came in the door and said, I, you know, I showed up out of nowhere. Uh, you haven't been returning our calls and whatnot, but here I am, and I'm going to pay you the 9000 That's great. So how would we record that? I'm going to tell you the way not to do it first, and then I'm going to tell you why it doesn't work that way. So one way that it would, it, you know, it kind of works, but it's not the way we're going to do it is that we can think it through our, our transactions and say, well, is cash affected? Yeah, we're going to debit cash because we got cash from the client. And we would normal credit receivable. However, we cannot credit the receivable now because we already wrote the receivable off. Where did we write the receivable off to? We wrote it off to the allowance account. So therefore, since we already wrote, we can see this 9,000 was written off to the allowance account. Why don't we just debit cash and credit the allowance account, which would cancel out this 9000 that we wrote off here. That would work, and uh, that works in terms of journal entries. However, uh, it doesn't really work in the system because if we then look analyze the receivable account, uh, it looks like this payment was uh, not paid. It looks like the customer is kind of like a deadbeat. And so if they came to us again, we don't have an audit trail in their um, subsidiary ledger showing that they actually paid us. It looks like they never paid us. So what we want to do is record this activity in the subsidiary ledger and have an audit trail on it. Therefore, instead of doing that, we're going to kind of break the rule of uh, thinking about cash first. And in this case, we're going to say, well, let's reverse what we did last time as of today. We're not going to we're not going to go back in time and do it. We're going to say as of today, we're going to reverse the prior journal entry putting this customer back in good standings on the subsidiary ledger, and then we'll do the normal transaction, which would be to debit cash and credit receivable. So that would look like this. So we're going to reverse the what we did last time, which was to write off the receivable. We're going to put the receivable back on the books by debiting the 9000 to put the receivable back in good standing here. And then we're going to credit the allowance account so we've reversed what we did last time. Now we're in our normal circumstance. Now we're back to the norm. And now we can then debit the cash like we normally would when we get money from a client and credit the receivable, reducing the receivable. 
So it would look like this. The, ca the cash is, is going, the, the receivable is going to go up by the 9,000 and then the allowance is going to be credited by the 9,000. Then we're going to debit the checking account by the nine and credit the receivable by the nine. Note the net difference in the receivable is, is zero. It went up and down. Therefore, in terms of journal entries, we, we could simplify the journal entry a lot by just debiting cash and uh, crediting the allowance. You'll note, in essence, that's what we did here. That's what happened. But th why don't we do that? Well, let's look what happened on the general ledger. And that is that the receivable went back up here. We debited the receivable here. And then we credited the receivable. So we put the we put it back in good standing. And then we took it off in kind of the normal process. On the allowance account, we can see that we reversed the allowance account here. And then on the subsidiary ledger, what happened for CW is note that we put the uh, 9000 back on the books as being owed to us. And then we wrote it, we wrote it off here. So the reason for that is, is we, if we look here, then the audit trail will basically show us that, uh, yeah, we wrote it off, but then we, we put them back in good standing. And then this 9,000, if we, you know, if we check the audit trail on that from the subsidiary ledger, it'll show a payment. Whereas if we didn't do these two transactions and we just looked at this item and we checked the audit trail, it would show that, uh, uh there was no payment and we wrote it off. So that audit trail is pretty much the reason why we would do this reversing process instead of just having a simple uh, journal entry that, that would just be half as, as long. All right, so then we determined that P company and BD company would not pay us the amount owed. So two more companies we've determined maybe at the end of the period, at the end of the year or so, that uh, they're not going to pay us. We're going to probably analyze our receivable accounts periodically and see that uh, uh, companies will not pay us. And if we look at P company here, we're going to write them off. So that 6-7 is going to have to go down and BD company is going to have to go down. That's the receivable accounts. So those are the amounts it will go down by. Therefore, the receivable is going to have to go down by that. And uh, that's going to be a credit. And then what are we going to debit? Once again, we're going to debit uh, the allowance account. So that would look like this. We're going to debit the allowance account for the 14.7 and credit the receivable. And once again, that adds up to the two clients, uh, C uh, company, uh, P company and BD company, the amounts that they owed. And therefore, uh, we're going to debit the receivable. I mean, credit the receivable. So the receivable is going to go down. It has a debit balance. We're going to do the opposite thing to it to make it go down. And then we are going to debit the allowance account, making it go down. Note that there's, once again, no change in the net receivable because the net receivable here was a debit of the receivable of 1,161 minus the credit of the allowance. That would be the net receivable. And then uh, they both went down. Therefore, the new net receivable is now 1,146,3 minus the 15,3. So if we look at the activity then, the question's being, do people owe us money? Yeah, people owe us 1,146,3. Well, who owes us the money? The GL just tells us by uh, date what has happened. So what has happened, it went by, it went down by 9, it went down by 30, uh, it went back up by 9, it went down by 9, and then we have this 14 went down by that. The allowance shows us the activity for the accounts that were uncollectible. Then the subsidiary ledger breaks it down by uh, customer or client. So here's what happened. There's that uh, 8,000 here as well as the uh, BD and P, the 6-7, that's what adds up to this 14-7. So we had to break that out between the two customers that don't pay us. If we add up all the receivables, then in the subsidiary ledger, it adds up to 1,146,3. That ties out to the general ledger. That ties out to the trial balance. And we still have this estimate of 15-3 that we determined was uncollectible. So... Now we're going to say it's at the end of the period. If it's at the end of the period now and um, we're, we're done with, with the year and we need to then determine what the allowance account should be at the end of the time period. There's a couple ways we can do this. If we think about this, we're, what we're saying here uh, is that the revenue account here of three, uh, 378000 if we made all those sales on account, we need to think about the amounts that will be uncollectible. So part of those sales are going to be uncollectible. And what we want to do is write off that uncollectible portion this period. We don't want to, we don't want to close out the books and then write it off next period. 
because then we'll write off the bad debt expense to uh, the next period. We want to match up the uncollectible accounts to this period. Now, we don't know who's not going to pay us. That's the problem. We know that we made a bunch of sales. We don't know who's not going to pay us. But we can make an estimate of that. And under generally accepted accounting principles, we have to because if we don't, then we're going to be overstating the revenue or the net income that we have earned in this time period and we'll be overstating the assets. So we have to make some kind of estimate and that's controversial because anytime you make an estimate uh, that, you know, you, it's just an estimate and you can uh, be off on, on an estimate. It's not exact, but in order to, to fix the matching problem, in order to present our financial statements in the most fair way and not overstate them, an estimate is better than, uh, than not having an estimate. So how could we make an estimate? One, we could look at the, the revenue side here and we could say, well, if we made all these sales on account, then based on past experience, we could take some percentage of the revenue and say that based on past experience, we have learned that this percentage is uncollectible. Therefore, uh, we can write off the bad debt expense, uh, debiting the expense, increasing the expense for that percentage portion of the revenue. Uh, the other way we that we can do it, which I'm going to show here, which I think is probably, to me, it, it's more exact to do because it seems like you can come up to a, a, a better estimate in this way is to actually look at the balance sheet account. And, and that would be the receivable account here. And then try to find a way to break down what portion of the receivables are going to be uncollectible. And so that's oftentimes you're going to look at something like an aging account in order to do that. So if we have this uh, 1,146,300, if we break that out, that 1,146,300 in terms of an accounts receivable aging, which could look something like this. A lot of softwares will have this and stuff like QuickBooks or something can generate this report. And if we have uh, something that's uh, 30 days past due, uh, we can have two, you know, we might say that 2% is uncollectible. If it's between uh, 30 and 60 past due, 4% perhaps, 60 and 90, 10% perhaps, and over 90, maybe there's a, a very high chance that it's going to be uncollectible. And this way we can break it down by how old the debt is, which is usually a fairly good indicator. If it's old, if the thing is older and we've been calling people forever and, they're not, and they haven't gotten back to us, then at some point we can say, yeah, there's a higher likelihood or probability that, you know, we're not going to get paid on that one. So where do we come up with these percentages? I, we would have to get those on past experience. And, and again, that's something that in you know, a problem the book would have to give you in real life we would have to do some careful analysis in terms of how we would come up with that. But if we multiply that out, then we're going to say this times this, we would come up with these numbers. And that would say that, okay, of the 1,146,300, we think based on this estimate that 50,437 will be uncollectible. Therefore, we still have 15,300 in the allowance account here. And that's because we basically overestimated last time. We thought that we weren't going to get, I think it was 40, at the at the beginning yeah it was 40 here last time and and we're still left with 153 at the end meaning that we we didn't write off as many not many people came and said they were not going to be collectible as we thought therefore in order to get this 153 up to the 50 we would do a subtraction problem and the difference being 35 1 uh, 37 is what we would need in order to bring that amount up to the estimate of 50,000. So if we posted this, so if we took the 50,000 uh, minus the 15,3, we come up with the 35,137. So now if we post this out, then we're crediting the, the 35,137 to the allowance. So that's going to take the 15,3 up by 35,137 to the 50,347 which matches the 50347 here. Then the other side is finally going to go to the bad debt expense. So now we're going to debit the bad debt expense by the 35, and that's going to bring it up to 35. And then if we look at what the effect is on net income, we're going to say of this revenue here, 35 of it, we believe is going to be uncollectible, meaning we're never going to get paid on that. And we make that estimate kind of like an adjusting entry as of the end of the time period, so that as of the date when we create the financial statements, we're showing a, a net income of the 342,863 instead of the 378. So we're, we're recording the fact, we're re representing the fact that of these sales, 
we believe this amount is going to be uncollectible. On the on the balance sheet side, we're also saying, yeah, we have revenue, we have receivables of one million one forty six three. However, we believe based on past experience that fifty thousand four thirty seven will be uncollectible. We want to disclose that to the readers. We want to be as fair as possible and not uh, be overstating our value. However, it's also just an estimate and uh, we could collect more. We could collect le less. That's our best guess. So we are now able to define the allowance method, record transactions related to recording bad debt, recording a receivable account that has been determined to be uncollectible, recording a receivable account that has been collected after being determined to be uncollectible.